In this presentation, we're going to be looking at the mechanism of visual perception. As we've seen already, how we, we think about the world is intimately connected with how we perceive the world, um, and vice versa. How we perceive things is intimately connected with how we think about things. Um, to understand uh, this a little bit better, I want to take you through the whole idea of visual perception. This is part one of two presentations, and in this one we're going to be focusing on uh, the physical aspect of perception, mostly the eye and the brain. So perception really can be broken down into two different things. There's the physical and then there is the conceptual. Uh, one way of thinking about this is one is the hardware and the other is the software. The software will take up in part two of this presentation. So if we look at the um, mechanism of perception the physical, at the physical level, we see there are three components. There's the world, objects in the world. There's the eye. Um, what, what the eye has inside it, how it responds, how it works, and then ultimately there's the brain. Now perception proper really refers to what the brain does with the information. So there is a difference between what comes into the eye and what we actually see. So we, it, but if we start with the eye, it'll be uh, illuminating for the rest of the discussion. So one of the most common uh, ways of thinking about perception is to think of it this way that the world comes to you, that you are a passive recipient of, let's say, visual stimuli. Uh, you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes, and the room jumps in. You, you see everything, or sounds come to you, or smells come to you. So what I say about visual perception in this talk really applies to all of the senses. But for most of us, this model of being the receiver, being on the passive end of, of uh, this mechanism, seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, and partly it's true. It's true to the extent that the eye is like a camera at some level. So there is a lens that focuses an image on the back. There is a chamber in the back of a camera. You might have film or uh, today it's a digital CDC array. Uh, but the eye has something at the back of it called the retina. A retina is a collection of cells that take the information, the visual light from the world and work with that information. Now the interesting thing about the retina is that it's made of nerve cells. So in one sense, or in a very real sense, uh, the retina is actually an extension of the brain. So at the very earliest stage of visual processing, we have the brain involved. And this is huge because the brain is not passive. What the brain does is it takes this information and it makes sense of it. So that is the true meaning of the term perception. So to show you uh, how this might work, I want you to look at this image right here. Uh, this image demonstrates a difference between seeing, which is the physical taking in of uh, visual information, dots of light, of photons, and perception, the making of meaning of it. So what I'd like you to do in a second is to stop this video and try and figure out what it is you're looking at. Okay, so stop it now, and then when you've got some ideas, turn it back on. Okay, so if you're like most people, you would have had a hard time figuring this out. Uh, what looks like a bunch of black and, and white and gray marks uh, probably gave you a little bit of a struggle in terms of what are you looking at. Some people might have said footprints or skulls, things like that. They're very common. But actually what you're looking at is a cow looking right back at you. So if we look at this image. There's the head of the cow. Here's the nose. These are the two eyes and these are the ears. This is the body and this is a fence in the background. Uh, so now that you see it, what you're experiencing is a difference between seeing and perception. Seeing is just taking in the raw visual information. Uh, we don't necessarily or don't always make sense of it. Perception is that sense making where we actually do something with that information um, and it becomes something. So now that you see the cow, it's pretty hard to unsee the cow. So what's happening is the brain is working on this information. It's doing stuff and it's happening all the time at a level we're not always aware of. So for, for the purposes of this discussion, this is a much better model for how we actually see the world. We are not passive recipients. We actually go into the world and do stuff with it. Um, we select, we edit, we manipulate, we change information. And so as a demonstration of this active nature uh, of perception, I want to just focus on a couple of things. Uh, the first is that we have a propensity to see things that are not there. So things that don't exist, we will quite easily see. 
Um, here's an example of that. Most people will say that they can see a white triangle in this image. But if you think about it, there is no white triangle. There's just a white background and six black objects. But they've been arranged in such a way as to create the impression that there is another object on top. Or here, if you look at these two orange circles, uh, for most people, they will appear to be different. The one on the right seems larger than the one on the left, uh, but they're not. So in other words, what you're seeing is something that doesn't exist. You're seeing difference where there is no difference. Uh, how is this happening? Well, because when we see things, uh, we see everything in context. We see everything environmentally, so to speak. Um, and that's really how we make sense of information. We very rarely just take pieces of visual information uh, in isolation by themselves. So another demonstration of that would be this. So these two dogs appear to be very different. The upper one is dark and the lower one is light. But if I take the background out, you can see they're exactly the same. So here the background is having a huge effect uh, of how we actually perceive those two dogs. Um, another example, for many of you looking at this image, you might think that the uh, image inside the circle is vibrating or moving. If it's not, just keep looking at it a bit longer. I can assure you it's not. Uh, even though this is a video, um, that's not a video in the middle. So one thing you can do is print this, take a screenshot, put it on paper. It'll still be vibrating on a piece of paper. So again, we're seeing something that is not actually there in the world. Uh, and then finally, another pretty strong example. For most people, these two tabletops, the gray and the blue, are different. This is long and thin, and this is short and wide but they're not. They're actually the exact same thing. What's happening is the information in the picture, which your brain um, knows in terms of you know, how the real world works, is telling you this is longer than this. Uh, so here we go. By demonstration, I've decided to outline uh, this table, and I'm just going to slide that image over. We'll slide it into place, and you can see it's the exact same size. Okay, so what all these things demonstrate uh, is something very interesting about the visual system. So the point I want to impress upon you is that our perception is not designed to faithfully represent the world. Okay, it's not about being a passive recipient and giving us an accurate image of what the physical world looks like. Instead, it's designed to help us survive. It creates meaning. And that uh, propensity for meaning making can be um, played with and manipulated in two-dimensional illusions. Okay, so let me give you a, an example of why seeing things incorrectly is actually uh, about seeing things correctly. So if we look at this image, these two red lines, right, they are the exact same size. They appear different. This is small, this is large. But if we put a horizontal line across the top and the bottom, they're the exact same size. So you might think, well, we've been fooled into thinking one's uh, bigger or smaller than the other. But sorry, whoops, wrong direction. But if we think about it, what this is actually telling us is if we actually saw this in the real world, if we came around a corner and saw a wall that looked like this with uh, a red stripe painted in these sections, we know that the one in the back would be bigger. It would be significantly bigger than this one, three times the size to be exact. And so what our brain is telling us is what's actually happening in the world, not what's hitting our eyes. So the fact that we see difference here is not a fault of our visual system. Uh, it actually demonstrates how well our visual system works because once we understand it, it's not about uh, telling us exactly what's in front of our eyes, but rather telling us about the world, um, then we have a whole different way of thinking about it. Here's another example. You might think, looking at this image, that you see some red strawberries. Uh, there's actually no red in this picture. All right. The strawberries themselves are all gray, but they appear red. So again, you might be thinking, I'm being fooled by it. Um, here's the color of that section of the strawberry taken out uh, using Photoshop. You can see it's very clearly gray. And if I extend this gray all the way into the image, you see how it sort of blends uh, with the rest of the image. So how is this happening? Well, what's happening is our eye is looking at the whole image and it's making certain inferences about what it's seeing. 
And one of the things it's saying is it's looking at this through a blue-green filter, or technically a cyan filter. So you can see the whole image looks like it's being looked at through a colored filter. Uh, so the eye is taking that information in. It's also taking in the information that the strawberries are gray. And so it makes the inference that if you look through a blue-green filter at something, and what comes out the other side, in other words, what hits your eye is gray, then the only way it can be gray is if the object on the other side of the filter is red. Okay? So the only way we can see gray, and our eye and our brain knows that we're seeing gray, is if the object behind a cyan blue-green filter is red, because the filter um, will take out the red. So the reason it's gray is because the red has been taken out. So we know that there's red there. So in the real world situation, we would know this is ripe red fruit that we could eat, even though what our eye is telling us is that it's gray. Okay, so again, we're, we're not um, designed to see what's actually there. We're designed to see what we know is or should be there. And this is also demonstrated in Adelson's famous checkerboard, checkerboard illusion, where the square A and square B are exactly the same gray. All right, Our eye uh, is picking up that they're same gray, but our brain is overriding that information and telling us that they're different. Uh, and here you can see that they are exactly the same gray with these stripes, there's no boundaries. But we know that they, got, they have to be different because we understand checkerboards. Uh, in the world and if um, you know in an illusion we can manipulate it to look like this but we know in the real world that they're going to be different so the brain it plays with this information another example of this ability of the brain um, to manipulate information is that we also don't see things that are there you know, things that are right in front of us so here I want you to look at this sentence and I want you um, to read it and then I want you to count how many F's are in the sentence above. So take a minute, stop the video, look at the um, sentence, and then count how many F's are in it. Okay, so you've done your counting, and hopefully the answer you got was six. There are six F's in that statement. Um, if you're curious or puzzled as to how there's that many, here's the answer. What's happening is, Again, our brain takes everything in contextually. We see the whole thing. So when we read, we actually don't read letters. We scan letters. We, scan, we look at whole words. We look at you know, what words next to what other words. And so we move very quickly across sentences. And as a result of that, we tend to overlook words like of because they're small. They're sort of uh, not consequential in terms of what we're doing. Another very famous example is the FedEx logo. Uh, if you know about this, then great. If you don't know about this, then again, stop your video. And what I want you to do is try and find the hidden symbol inside the FedEx logo. All right, so if you don't know it, stop the video now. Okay, so hopefully you found the, the hidden symbol, and if you've identified the white arrow, you're correct. So this arrow was put there by the designer um, to communicate to our brain at a, at a subconscious, subliminal level something about FedEx. Now the arrow gives a sense of movement, a sense of directionality, and that direction is towards the future because we read from left to right. So this is about the, the movement of packages uh, from here to there. Now you can imagine if this was reversed, it wouldn't be a very good uh, subliminal message for a moving company, uh, sorry, mailing packaging company, because everything you send out might be sent right back to you. Um, so this is there, but most people don't see it. Um, if you didn't know what these shapes were, if you couldn't read English, you might see it more clearly because your brain doesn't scan this as quickly. It looks at them as shapes. Um, and an example of that would be the Arabic FedEx. So this is what FedEx looks like in Arabic. Because they read um, from right to left, we can see that the arrow goes in the other direction. And again, because you probably don't know what these letters mean unless you speak Arabic, our brain just sees them as shapes, and so the shape of the arrow stands out um, a little bit more. Okay, so those are several examples of how the brain actually manipulates information. The other aspect about the brain and the eye and the world is that we don't get the whole picture. 
We open our eyes, we see a whole bunch of stuff, we think that's the world, but we're gravely mistaken. And one way to demonstrate that is to just to talk about um, a subset of that, which refers to color. So in the eye, we have these special cells in the retina, um, but amongst those cells, we have something called photoreceptors uh, or cones, and we have three of them three different types. We have millions of them, but three different types. And they're each designed to pick up and respond to a different part of the color spectrum. So uh, what you can see above here is here's the spectrum from red all the way down to blue and then ultraviolet. And these are our three cones. One cone picks up everything under this uh, red shape. The other cone is sensitive to things under the green and the other cones sensitive to things under the blue. So it's like having three tubes of paint and we can mix all of these colors. Um, but the thing about the cones and the eyes is that other animals and creatures have different numbers. So here's a pigeon's eye. And you'll notice there's a fourth one right here, which means the pigeon can see this part of the spectrum, which is known as ultraviolet. We can't. We, do, we can pick up tiny, tiny pieces, but really we can't see. So the pigeon's color sense, um, they see colors we can't see. They see something uh, totally different in the world. Um, and if we look at other animals, we can see uh, how this works out. So dolphins, for instance, they only have one cone, which basically means they can't see any colors. Everything's just basically light or dark. Uh, cats and dogs, including uh, large cats, ha have two. So they see roughly 10,000 colors, whereas we see approximately a million colors. But when you go to four, uh, like birds, it goes up by a factor of 100. They can see 100 million colors, 100 times more color than we can. And then if we go to five, there are some creatures like uh, butterflies, for instance, um, they can see about 10 billion colors. So what we can actually see of the world is a very, very select slice. Uh, it's not the whole picture. Um, and when humans have color blindness, it means that one of their cones is affected. So they're much more like dichromats. So their color uh, vision is limited. So at the top here, this is what maybe a normal three cone human can see. And then there's three types of color blindness, depending on which cone is affected. And you can see that the colors available um, to color blind humans are much more limited. Um, we test for color blindness by doing something like this, the Ishihara color blindness test. And what they do is people are shown arrays like this with a number inside. And if you can see the number, it means you're not colorblind. But if you can't see the number, um, then it's an indication that you might be colorblind and subject to further testing. Um, here's another example. This is a testing for anomalous trichromacy. Uh, which is another rare form of color blindness. So if you can't see the number in here, um, then you would be considered partially color blind. And actually, I'm just playing a joke on you because there's no number in here. <laughs> anyway, I hope that didn't cause too much stress. So we go back to bees and butterflies and birds. Um, here's an example. So what a human might see would be something like this, whereas somebody who can see in ultraviolet would see different patterns along the edges of the leaves or different patterns on the wings. Now we don't know what colors these are, but we do have ultraviolet cameras that can detect them so we can uh, take pictures of them, but this is not actually what they're seeing. So um, just by looking at the physical hardware of our perceptual system, uh, what conclusions can we derive? Basically two of them. One, that physical perception is limited. We don't get the whole picture. We only get a small part of it. And I've only just focused on color. There are many other aspects um, of this that can demonstrate that. But the most important is the idea that perception is active, that it makes meaning so we can survive in the world. It's about what's in the world. It's not designed to represent or create an accurate picture of the world that allows us to navigate. Okay, so that concludes part one of this uh, presentation. In part two, we're going to look at the conceptual and the cultural influences uh, on our perception and how that works.